Well, everybody, what's the crack? And welcome back to episode number 30 fucking 5 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. How are you all getting on? Things are lovely here in Cologne. The weather is beautiful. It's the kind of weather that just reminds you of going out for a pint on a Saturday at 2 o'clock to watch Ireland in the rugby and a half time you go outside for a bit of fresh air and that lovely spring sun just hits you in your red face and you begin to sober up. And it's also a reminder that St. Patrick's Day is creeping up the stairs ready to pinch you in your wee bum. So this episode will serve as a lovely appetizer, an amuse bouche, if you will, for St. Patrick's Day because this week's guest is someone I've admired for many years. Personally, I'm a classically trained musician who branched into Irish folk music. I don't think I ever would have done it if it wasn't for this guy. Between his book, Irish Music on the Silver Flute, genuine incredible by the way, it teaches you how to play Irish music authentically on your lovely Boehm modern flutes, and his iconic album, The Madrid Sessions, um, my college years were spent obsessing over this fella. It is none other than the folk music expert, multi-instrumentalist, award-winning recording artist, and one of my favourite ever flute players, Philip Barnes. Now, Philippe also very kindly sent me a copy of his new album, The Clearwater Sessions, but between German customs and receiving something from outside the European Union, it is yet to clear. So, I've asked my team to CGI in the cover of the album, you can see it here, and it also comes with a book of transcriptions. So it's a flute and piano album. You can get the original piano without flute recording on the record. And Philippe has transcribed the flute part so you can play along. And it looks like this. Now, the album, Clearwater Sessions, is out on St. Patrick's Day itself, the 17th of March, for those who aren't aware. So I recommend you pour yourselves a wee Bushmills whiskey and enjoy it. It's on the usual places and formats. And you can get more info at philippebarnes.com. Also, if you're based in London, you lucky people, there is a launch party. It's on Thursday, the 20th of March, at the World Heartbeat in Battersea. So, contact me or Philippe for more information on that. Unfortunately, that's my mum's birthday, so I can't make it. So, if you do go, please send me some pictures. Now, the interview is coming now, but quickly, as usual. <coughs> the NIG podcast is free and will always be free. However... If you wish to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon. On the screen now is the address, and for the audio listeners, it is patreon.com forward slash the in nine the in nine G flute podcast. Oopsies. It costs five euros or whatever that is in your currency, five quid, I think, or five US dollars per month. And with that, you're keeping this podcast alive. I do everything around here on my own, including marketing, graphic design, research scripts, audio, video, etc. etc. Becoming a patron helps generate a regular income for this podcast meaning i can turn down other work to focus on it and it also lets me travel to meet and greet the best flute players in the world and ask them who their favorite spice girl is as a little thank you you will get a chance to ask these people your questions directly and you'll get all the episodes a little bit earlier than everyone else so if you can afford it sign up over there is incredibly appreciated if you can't afford it don't worry it's grand you can listen for free so without further ado ado I do. I do. This week's Inline G flute podcast is with the iconic Philippe Barnes. Um, so, first thing I like to ask most of my guests is the ones who are flute players anyway, is do you play Inline G or Offset G? Just because it is the uh, Inline G flute podcast. So, on your Bowen flute, do you play Inline G or Offset G? Inline. Yeah. And Ooh. have always done since i started is there a reason for that um it started my teacher said that uh it would be better for me and then i stuck with it because i liked having less mechanism Mm -hmm. on the flute and whether it's true or not i uh kind of always went for a flute that had as little as possible stuff attached to the tube so no c-sharp trill no e mechanism, no extra stuff, just um, you know, bare minimum. Can you tell me a little bit about your bow and flute as well? Because obviously you're a bit of an expert in all kinds of flutes, but what kind of bow and flute do you play? Uh, it's a Altus sixteen oh seven. And when I originally got it, it was just a C foot. Um mm-hmm. and then eventually I realized that I really wanted the the B foot. So I spent ages looking for someone selling just the foot joint second hand and that's not um, easy managed to get hold of one um and it's surprisingly expensive just for one extra note but yeah uh... <laughs> i've never had a b foot joint actually i don't know i've never 
like the few times where I've needed a beef joint, I've just borrowed one for the gig. But it's quite rare that I need one. I never really bothered. And I bet like yourself, I like like my flute's in nine G, no splitty, mm-hmm. none of the. I know I like that very clean aesthetic of just bare minimum. Yeah. Um, I think mine is the seamed tubing on mine. I feel like that makes a difference. And, you know, whether that's just uh, me think making it up in my mind, that sort of doesn't matter to me if it's, okay. if it's smoke or mirrors, you know? <laughs> well, I've talked quite a lot about the psychological effect of that as well. Sometimes the placebo effect works. Like, it's the yeah. main reason I play gold, honestly. Like, when I saw that I could afford, because my flute's five card gold, so it's affordable gold. And when I saw that I could afford a gold flute, I was instantly like in love with it just because I always loved the idea of playing on gold. Yeah. And it might not even suit me that much. I'm sure there's flutes out there that would suit me better. But the placebo effect of me going, I've got a gold flute like James Galway. It just, <laughs> it really works for me. Um, seamed tubing. Can you explain what that is? So instead, it's uh, like a, they, I think they do it flat and then roll it into a tube and then um, solder yeah. it up, I guess. Um I don't know why it's different. Um, okay. There's, you know, like lots of people will have all of the information about why it's different and I just get on with playing it, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, to be honest, I need to ask someone about it. If anyone listening does know the answer to that, please let me know. I'm going to interview a, a flute maker at some point and get these questions answered. Yeah, I don't you know, know um, Pera Alcon, the head joint maker, Yeah, um, he made me a, a head joint with just the wooden lip and he does a lot of seamed tubing and he's just made okay. a whole flute that I think is seamed tubing. I think he'd be a good man to, to answer Ooh. the question. I usually just let someone else on Facebook correct me. Oh, well, yeah. I'm not going to talk too much about Facebook at the minute. <laughs> me and Facebook don't get on at the minute. <laughs> um, right, next question. I'm sorry I have to ask this question. I have to get this out of the way very early. So I've sent you a quest, the questions yeah. over before because I'm, you know, I'm a very professional podcaster. Um, but you're you obviously do all kinds of music and for anyone that hasn't checked out i'll be telling everyone in the introduction what you do and where to check out your stuff you do everything but you're very well known for doing irish traditional music especially on the bowen flute but you're one of the most well-known in my opinion anyway most well-known irish flute players but you're english how do you find that how do you find getting into that irish word with an english accent well it is a it's a question i get asked a lot um yeah something i have thought about a lot and oh, really? haven't really come up with a short uh, elevator pitch answer for that. Um, you do have to justify it, don't you? I grew up in Brighton on the south coast of England. Yeah. And my family is, uh, one side is Breton and German. Ah. And the Bretons have a similar tradition to Irish and Scottish, but... Um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, quite in a way quite different, but it's... Uh, music for dancing that has like a simple form but it's about um improvising around the form and um the other side is scottish and english okay you got everything so like in a lot of ways i would say that i have more affinity with scottish music okay and you know not growing up totally within one of those traditions in scotland or in ireland it's um you know it's difficult to decide like what am i doing how am i uh how am i sort of aligning myself and what am i what am i actually playing is it irish music is it scottish music is it um celtic music and that's a you know a whole difficult decision to be where where you sit within those things and you know as, as a flute player naturally there's a lot more uh, flute playing in the Irish tradition than the Scottish tradition, although okay. there's a lot of whistle playing because um, all the bagpipers um, are all great whistle players. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I fully decided what the answer is to that question, Okay. but just that I really love the music in Ireland. I love the music That's from Scotland. Answer. And, you know, the the Irish and the Scottish have made their way all over the world and you can go any anywhere and find an Irish session, people playing the music yeah. mm-hmm. who aren't Irish and are Irish. And um, I would say that I just hope to do justice to any traditional stuff that I'm playing. And all of my original stuff is inspired by those things. 
Beautiful answer, beautiful. Do you actually get asked a lot, genuinely, about your accent? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Um, oh, I thought I was the first. <laughs> like, all the time, if we're, if we're playing a session in a pub, people always want to come up and, and say, oh, you know, why you why do you play Irish music? Usually it's because they're from Ireland and they want to know if they know your cousin, you know? Yeah, which is a good chance, to be fair. But, um, you know, I, I studied over in Ireland. I did a master's at Limerick University yeah. and um, spent a few years touring with the Dave Munley band. Ah. And, uh, you know, but nowadays, like, we've just been at Celtic Connections. We're there all the time. And some of the bands I listen to most would be the sort of modern Scottish bands like Met Clear, um, mm-hmm. like Duncan Lyle and Jonathan Henderson. And, um, Out of curiosity, then, do you find, like, just for people listening to the podcast, what are the main differences between sort of the Irish traditional music and Scottish traditional music? Oh, that's a difficult one. Okay. Um, for a beginner's guide, can you give me like a, yeah. explain okay. me as if I'm five? Uh, I probably, you know, I'm very happy to be connect, corrected by anybody listening, but um, I would say there's a, a difference in the kind of accent of the music in the same way like people speaking, like, the Scottish tradition is a lot more, I would say, classical and clean. And okay. um, the ornamentation is more kind of uh, angular. Yes. And crisp. I crisp is maybe a nice word for it. Yeah. Um, whereas the Irish tradition is a lot more kind of flowing and lyrical. Yeah. Lyrical and. Um, you know, it's a ve- that's a very uh, broad. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's a good start. Like I, like I dabble in Irish music, like really mm-hmm. just dip my toes into it and play in some sessions and stuff and enjoy it. But you can normally tell when a Scottish tune comes up for that reason because it feels a bit, it feels a bit. Yeah, angular is a good word. There's something about it. There's a bit of an edge to it. You go, oh yeah, that's Scottish. There's something. I think. I mean, you could almost equate it to, you know, if it's raining in Scotland it's that's some cold hard rain and if it's raining yeah. in Ireland, it's yeah. like a gentle mist and i feel like that comes do you reckon that plays the, a part do you reckon it's to do the with the culture then <laughs> do you yeah, really I think, think that, that yeah a lot you know i think place has a huge effect on the music that comes that, that comes out and it's you know the lines are getting more and more blurred because everybody has access to everything yeah now yeah. you know um but your, you know, your experience of living in a place is still definitely going to affect the way you play and the way you respond to suppose, yeah. to things. You know, living. Yeah, I never in really a, considered that. If you live in a in a lovely, relaxed village with nothing going on, or if you live in the middle of London and you're mm. always getting the tube, you're gonna. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna express it differently. Yeah, yeah. Or if you grew up in the, you know, like Belfast, like I did, and you know, yeah, rough Belfast. You know, that's why I'm. That's why I play with such edge. That's not true at all. People ask me that all the time. I love playing up to that so much because when people hear my accent, like, oh, where are you from? And you say Belfast and they go, oh, tough over there. And I always love going, yeah, yeah, tough, man. I grew up in the war. (laughs) I didn't. I didn't grow up in a war at all. I had a very lovely childhood, but I love playing up to it. Um, Yeah, I always find that with Scottish music, it feels a bit more angular. But what's your, what did you learn initially? Did you learn classical flute? Did you learn the Breton style? Did you learn traditional? What did you pick it up with? Um, I started flute when I was 11 and I started, uh, classical and I started my, my mum was a big James Galway fan and I think nice. she just wanted me to learn Annie's song. Yeah, I see him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I had really bad asthma as a kid and they thought oh. playing the flute might help with that. Um, did it? And it definitely did. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. I yeah I pretty much have no trouble with the with the asthma anymore. Wow, okay. Um, but I feel like you know nature along the way has thrown in some some other things. I had a collapsed lung when I was eighteen. Uh, it's like someone really doesn't want me to play the flute. Yeah, but I just say so was, was that is that because of asthma or was it just was it an accident or did that just happen? It's uh, sometimes it's a spontaneous pneumothorax. So it's like <clears throat> a little bubble of tissue on the lung just bursts and pulls it open my brother had one exactly the same age what is it hereditary um, or is that just really bad luck yeah it's like a it's a hereditary oh, man that's a new fear unlocked for me <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know that one was coming um so okay you started with classical flute when did you start dabbling in folk music 
Um, reasonably quickly, I mean, my my um, Scottish granny played a bit of accordion, um, okay. and but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really like there wasn't traditional music in the home and such. But uh, one of my friends at school played fiddle, and okay. there's a really good Irish uh, and you know traditional session scene in in Brighton. Oh, there? um, okay. There's a couple of really great players there. Mandy Murray, the Constantina player and uh, okay. Nick Pin, the fiddle player and stuff. So there was um, that stuff going on. And my friend started taking me to, uh, he he played for one of the Morris teams in Brighton. So he'd take me ah. along to those and took me along to Folkworks Summer School. I met Niall Keegan, who runs the course at Limerick um, mm-hmm. and who I ended up studying with. Um, and were you doing the sessions on your classical flute at the time? Were you doing the bone yeah. flute? Wow, okay. So you straight away got into that idea of playing classical or Irish music or traditional music on the bone flute? Yeah, well, I mean, this was a long time ago, so it was much harder to get a wooden flute. Okay. And it was much harder to get information about where to get one from as well. Like, there wasn't... Um, uh, there wasn't someone who told me where I could get one or um, yeah, there yeah. wasn't someone playing <clears throat> wooden flute where I was. So I was just like, well, this is what it is. And I, I ordered one off the internet um, and I won't say the maker because I really disliked it. And, okay. Uh, then we'll not shame them. It was really out of tune and I was just like, oh, this is pointless. And I went to a couple of shops and, you know, if you, you can't really pick up a wooden flute off the shelf. You can like now get a decent keyless yeah. one from from some of the shops for sure but back then it, it was just like a chair leg with some holes in it you know yeah okay <laughs> beautifully put so you know i just i started trying to do it on the silver flute and then it just became like i actually i'm really enjoying doing this and it was quite a long time before i um eventually felt comfortable playing wooden flute as well um, okay and okay. it was actually during my master's that uh, Niall uh, kind of forced me to do half of the performance on wooden flute, half of it on. So you started your masters on bone flute in traditional yeah. music. Wow, yeah. had anyone done that before? I have never heard of it. Um, I'm not sure. I know there was someone doing the BA at the same time as me. It was the same time I was doing the MA. They were doing the, yeah. the bachelors, and and they were doing silver flute because um, they interviewed me for one of the. Uh, dissertations but um i mean there is like do you know Joni madden from cherish the ladies i don't um she plays um bone flute and whistle and is you know fantastic player i think she maybe plays closed hole actually um oh okay but uh, she has a cherish the ladies are huge in america and she has a um like a folk and irish cruise ship that goes around with goes in the summer with loads of loads of bands and stuff but so the ship's just for irish music like folk and irish yeah, music it's like a big like it's not like permanently that i think it i think it's like oh, a couple okay, of weeks okay. of the year sort of thing uh, have you been on it have you played on it or no you... no i just i saw it recently and i was like this is this is amazing I oh like that'd be a sweet it, but... gig as well that'd be a great gig wouldn't it just playing on the cruise ship all day and yeah oh, i'm not sure that. how uh how i'd get on with the seasickness and the and they drink. Oh, well, if you get seasickness, then it's probably the worst idea that you could do <laughs> to go on, a, on an Irish music ship. I can't believe that you went to university playing the bowling flute. Because, like, when I go to sessions, like, I run a session here in Cologne, mm-hmm. and it's a mixture of, like, classical players that are coming to Irish music and a lot of, like, old traditional, like, older Germans that have really dived into it. Because when Germans, like, do something, they really do it. If they pick yeah. it up as a hobby, it's not a hobby. Like, these lads will come in and they go to Ireland four times a year for the last 30 years and they'll study it like the ass out of it um, yeah. and they come in they know more than we do but when they see a bowen flute they're very like oh we don't we don't play them and i never <laughs> knew that it was really accepted but well i, I mean, can't I mean know. you did a study in it i don't know about accepted that's uh <laughs> i mean you know a long time i'd always go to the session and people would be like oh he's bought the typewriter oh yeah that's a good one yeah yeah, yeah. um and when i was you know sort of nervous shy 15 year old I would be like devastated by by that but now I'm like no that's really funny <laughs> yeah well now you're fine yeah because obviously so you started picking up Irish music in the bone flute 
I've, I'll probably mention the introduction, but now it's, I wouldn't say it's your thing, but certainly you wrote a book on it and how to play Irish music on the ball and flute, which is what I, I'm amazed at because nowadays when I go to play Irish music on my ball and flute, um, I do it because I've read your book and I've heard mm-hmm. your albums doing it. So I thought, oh, if he can make it sound that good, then it is possible. But that's the only reason I would do it. I would never have considered it before. It was yeah. until I got your album and your book. But when you were studying it, obviously there was no reference point, was there, for someone doing this kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, um, in a way, it's like every instrument is the same. Uh, you, you know, you can find a way to do those ornaments. You can find a way to... You know, all the instruments are mimicking each other. Like some of the ornaments come from True. the pipes. You know, like a crown is only there because at some point you get to the bottom of the instrument and your ornament has yeah. to be made up of things above. You can't go below. I mean, yeah. you get that on the fiddle as well. Has um, when when you get to the open string, you do an ornament like yeah. that, and um, or you're trying to copy something that's uh, kind of an idiosyncrasy of the pipes or the whistle on a different instrument and um it just takes a little bit of time to kind of work it out and yeah to you know decide that you want to fit it in you, you want to feel like it sounds like it's part of the tradition and doesn't sound like yeah um like a crossover yeah trying to, or a mixture you know mimic yeah that makes sense yeah it really um, does. Like, it, it's incredible. Like, I remember when I got your Madrid Sessions album, someone had recommended it to me when I was young. I was still in college, actually. Hmm. Someone had recommended it. And I could, even now when I listen to it, if you did, if I didn't know, I would swear it was, I wouldn't flute. I would swear. I would never know, which is incredible. But do you, do you incorporate anything from classical playing into it? Do you ever think like, oh, I'll use a bit of vibrato or a bit of this? Or is it really trying to go after it? Um, I probably opened up, have I opened up Pandora's box there mentioning the V word? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I would never say never. I mean, the vibrato is a, is something that I would generally just strip out of the, yeah. the sound. And it, but in a slow piece, you know, there's going to be points where you want to um, just texture the end of yeah. a, end of a note. And then the vibrato seems right. I mean, that Madrid sessions album, the first track, um starts with a sort of heroic intro thing which probably does have a bit of vibrato in yeah because it's like a at the time i was like thinking of it as like a three movement kind of thing with a slow intro and then a um it has like a little five four jig thing and then it yeah, goes into yeah. a, a slide like 12 8 um and it's in you know the slide is in c and it does some kind yeah. of harmonic things you wouldn't expect from a from a tune. So it's a bit like a, my youthful attempt at um, kind of bridging the, doing a sort of classical piece yeah. inspired by, by Trab. But definitely, you know, there's a bit of vibrato going on there. But as a general rule, like to get that sound, you want to do all of the work with the fingers. So um, like the finger vibrato instead of yeah diaphragmatic um see i always find when i'm doing like i'm not at all an expert in Irish traditional music at all i'm just i just happen to be irish so it's i sound like i have a lot of authority on the subject because i have belfast <laughs> accent but i really don't um but when i play I've, I've used like finger vibrato and stuff but there's sometimes where i just can't help but putting in not because it's so part of me when you're on mm-hmm. a note to go oh, it needs a bit of it just needs a bit of that and i yeah. there i feel like there is maybe a little there's a little leeway in there where you can just just sprinkle yeah. a little bit on top. I'll probably notes. let you off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think as well uh, for my taste, a lot of flute players of any genre probably use vibrato too much these days. Yeah, it's becoming. And I feel like in years now, um, you know, it's always that thing. Like, it's great if you can do it. But if you do it all the time, it's not interesting anymore. It's like yeah. if you play super fast all the time, it's not interesting. If you yeah. if you hold that if you hold that magic back and you can really Yeah. You save know. it for the yeah. So you yeah, the one just I just eat dessert all the time, do you? Yeah, see everyone has one of these for vibrato. Everyone has one of these like 
comparisons mine was <laughs> you don't put ketchup on everything for bad it was like ketchup and you put it that's in everything a terrible I like, example put i know because I, I, sure. I i love ketchup man i put it in everything <laughs> so that's why my vibrato is always there i'm a yeah. sucker for vibrato as well to be fair though i like both i love when people play without it because it's so difficult and from a technical point of view i'm so impressed by it because vibrato is so it makes it so much easier to play when you just whack a bit of vibrato on it, it brings the pitch up it makes the shape easier you don't have to think as much but yeah i like both like I love when I hear players do a beautiful like Baroque piece even without vibrato, mm. but at the same time, I love hearing like Jimmy Galway playing a stone movement to Mozart, like, you know, with proper. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love it both, man. But yeah. you're saying about your youthful attempt. I, I so researching this podcast, because I, I genuinely am a fan. Like I love that Madrid Sessions album so much back in the day, but I cannot believe it was 2006 it was released. <laughs> man, that is so long ago. Like it doesn't feel like that long ago. Um... <laughs> And like I still talk about it. Even recently I had a I had a girl on the podcast called Jill Jillian Dare. She's mm-hmm. like a, a flute player out in Canada. And we were talking about Irish music. Um not on the podcast, but just chatting. And then I was like, Have you checked out Philip Barnes' book? Because you'll get like how to bet in a silver flute, blah, blah, blah. Um and she went, Yeah, I just discovered his Madrid sessions album. And people are still finding this album and coming yeah. new to it. How does that like how do you feel looking back on it? Do you do you... um you know what I mean? Well, I mean, I'm really proud of that album. And uh, at the time, like Tom and I were playing together a lot, doing different stuff. And um, he used to do a lot of jazz gigs in one of the one of the bars in Brighton. And he'd get me along to play to play flute, even though I was terrible at improvising at that. You know, I was just like uh, fumbling around and I could read the tunes in the real book. And then as soon as it got to the solo, it was like. (laughs) Oh, really? But, uh, so did you um, read music for it or did you memorize the tunes or how did you structure that when you were doing that? Oh, for, for the Madrid? Yeah. Um, so it's, I'd say it's probably about half traditional tunes, half original. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had decided like a kind of structure before we left. We had a little run okay. through at, at the house. Um, and we were looking for somewhere to record and everywhere in London and Brighton was super expensive. And the Euro was quite low against the pound at the time. So it was actually a lot cheaper to go to Madrid, to Madrid. And we got like <laughs> an incredible studio there, that, um, the Cine Arte studios. And, um, the only problem was that neither of us really spoke any Spanish and the engineer didn't really speak any English. Um, well, whatever happened, it worked. <laughs> Uh, but we like I had for some of the pieces I'd have just like the the melody there because like sometimes I find it much easier to think of something think of a variation if I can see the original framework of the melody yeah you know and I think that comes from years of playing from music um, yeah and I have lots of friends who don't really read music at all and you know are kind of a lot freer in certain ways because of that but then if yeah. they need to you know if they're going into a recording session or something it's that's harder for them but they'll just learn it and yeah you know they'll make it work so but yeah sometimes i find it easier just to have the the music there just to see what i'm trying yeah. to build something around like visually because like i find yeah. that when i play in the session sometimes if i have or if i play irish music if i have the tune in front of me i can visually imagine like playing a third higher or a fourth yeah. higher or sort of picture like oh there's an f i can play a c above that it visually it really helps me is that the same thing for you then it just sort of yeah exactly yeah okay yeah and it's taken me um i still feel like i'm i'm probably about 50 50 now but i'm still more of a kind of visual player than a okay player i still like um, if I'm learning a tune by ear, it takes me a lot longer than my, like my wife plays the fiddle. Yeah. Um, and she, she can read okay, but like she would say she's not a reader and okay. um, she can pick up a tune just immediately straight away. And oh, it would okay. take me okay. like embarrassingly longer. <laughs> really? How long would it take you to pick up a tune? Cause you're making me feel better about this than I, cause I'm always ashamed of how slow I am. Like if, if you heard a, it's a random jig or a reel, how long do you think it would take you to pick it up uh it would depend how difficult it was like if it if it's a session and someone's playing a polka yeah i can be in the next time round. okay like if it's (laughs) if it's a you know if it's a jig or a reel if it's if it's in an easy key 
then you know and if it's made up of bits that i already know because you know a lot of those tunes yeah um, the they're structure. made up of those same little cells of information yeah um, and sometimes if there's something tricky in it it's easier to pick up because it it's kind right. of more you know more uh, uh obvious yeah because it's something different um oh, but then if, you know if it's fiddle players then they're playing in, and they're playing in D minor or G minor and uh, those kind of things. And it will take me a lot longer. And especially like, cause mm. sometimes I'll take both flutes to the session. Sometimes I'll just take the wooden flute. Okay. And then my D minor and G minor is, is pretty slow on the wooden flute. Um, oh, well, uh. cause it's that difficult thing of like, you know, I get lazy with, with carrying stuff to a session. If I'm going on the tube, yeah. do I want to take both of them? Do I just want to take one of them? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would totally get that. So yeah, going back to the Madrid sessions then. So yeah. Do you still listen to it? Do you still go back and look at it? Are you one of those people that can listen to your own records? Or would you rather? <laughs> um, I've definitely listened to it um, more than I'd like to admit to. Um, I haven't listened nice. to it for a really long time. And I think it's at the time, uh, like the recording didn't go, like we were really happy with it when we were listening on the big mm -hmm. studio speakers. And then when we got it home, we were like, oh, there's far too much bleed from the piano to the flute and the flute to the piano. Okay. And we realized at the end of that, we did, it was only three days recording, but and the guy was like, oh, is this a demo? We're like, no, it's supposed to be the thing. <laughs> no, no, see, <laughs> see, si, si. exactly. No demo. <laughs> like, um, so it took a long time to kind of mix it, to get it that you could hear both. Okay. And something I've really tried to fix in the new album, um, the separation's really good. The flute's really, the mics are really close. You can really hear it. But okay. um, the whole first day of the Madrid Sessions album, we, we'd we had a little coffee in the morning and uh -huh. neither of us realized how strong Spanish coffee is. <laughs> so, so what like happened? The, the first morning, everything we played was just terrible. Like it had zero <laughs> groove, zero vibe. It was just, it wasn't that it was too fast. It just was awful. <laughs> Yeah, because there's there's that line between coffee giving you that little boost, and then that little that little yeah. it just tips over into panic attack territory, mm. where that's that's a line you have to really you have to toe that line carefully. Okay, so did nothing stick from the first day? Nothing from the first recording session made it to the final cut? No. Okay. But, I mean, the, when we're playing together, I we tend to work pretty quickly. I mean, we we book three days. Um, incredible. Th we book three days for the Clearwater. And um, the the engineer said, oh, do you want to do, I think it was 10 till 8 or 12 till 10? I was like, uh -huh. 10 hours? <laughs> so I don't know, I would find us. that normal to record a record. Like, no. Well, He's in so the first day, I said, look, look we'll, do 10, we'll do 10 till 8. We went in the first day, we did a couple of hours just setting everything up, getting everything working and um, recorded a tune that we were like totally set on. Um, and then we're like, okay, we're going to go for lunch. And he's like, oh, we can order a lunch in and like keep working through lunch. And I'm like, we're, we're going to go for lunch. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so I think we took two hours lunch and we came back and did like, oh, nice. three hours recording. And then it was like six o'clock. And I was like, I think that's us. We're away for a pint to see you. <laughs> us for the day. Like we're going to, yeah, we're going to go for dinner and in, enjoy a bit of the, the day and he was like amazed that we didn't want to absolutely rinse the recording time and i was like well there's only two of us like we're going to be too tired to play for 10 hours you know that's a really good attitude as well yeah i feel like that's always the way we're recording there's there you you push yourself too hard sometimes and then it's not going to get better you know it's not yeah. you get a take and you go right that's i like that i'm happy with it you just take it yeah i mean usually like the first or the second take is has the best energy and I always that, find that it's diminishing returns and unless you're like fixing little bits or you know sometimes yeah. if you're I quite like to write in the studio um because that kind of I, like I need a deadline to do something but write in the studio is in write for the album that you're recording yeah yeah let's like create brief. the stuff and work on it because <laughs> brief. that you know it means especially if I'm with Tom like that first moment of inspiration is when some of the best stuff comes out. And if you work on it and work on it and work on it, you kind of distill it down into something which is good, but it's like, 
there's something nice about that original inspiration that has a has a different kind of excitement you know yeah the first to be fair the madrid session album has that vibe it has like a almost like a live vibe and yeah. i like the name of it being a session like the madrid sessions you know it's that implies not like an irish music session mean like a recording session it implies yeah. that kind of chilled out mm-hmm. vibe okay well you've mentioned it now so i really want to get into because this is the bulk of the podcast i want to talk about the new album so it's called the clearwater sessions um what's the latest what's the crack with it tell everybody what's going on so it's coming out on the 17th of March, which I thought oh, was, you know, what a day. because it's St. Patrick's Day. I know it um, is, yeah. <laughs> and then I realized that doing the launch on St. Patrick's Day is a terrible idea because all of my musician friends are, are going to be working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, and it, you are know, you going to do a launch party? Uh, yeah, the week after. I'm just finalizing okay. the the venue but we we will do one in london um okay my plan for a tour for it is slightly scuppered because i've just accepted the come from away uk tour starting in two weeks time and running till the 5th of january 2025 whoa so okay, that's a hell of a tour okay um which you know which is gonna, i'm really excited about cause I, I was uh depping on it in the west end and i love the show and getting to play lots of whistle and flute and pipes and stuff so um but yeah the, did you That's get a nice problem to have did you get the the record in the post not yet no but that okay. is the german post so well, it will be here at some point in the next year i'll oh, show you that. Okay. yes i love Beautiful. the cover by the way i absolutely love it um i love the font i was talking about this recently because oh, yeah. i love this like hyper stylized font was that who Ooh. designed the fo- oh the colored vinyl as well so um uh, it's beautiful my friend nick carter he plays drums with us um he's also a great photographer and um general kind of tech wizard uh so i took him with us to video um the recording and to take pictures and stuff and he did he did all the design and um i had to convince him to do the to do that photo for the cover because he okay. he didn't um agree with the vision at the time <laughs> okay artistic differences classic the dystopian netflix series uh, <laughs> artwork but um, i love it i think it looks great is it is is it deliberately meant to be a sequel to the madrid sessions or a follow-up from the madrid sessions or is yeah. it just yeah okay good yeah i think like we did one a couple of years ago which we didn't announce i just quietly put it out um and we didn't do any promotion no. any gigs um and that was we recorded it at Real World, um, and that's got some stuff on there that I'm pro- that I'm really proud of, and some of those have become. Sheet this music. was the EP um, yeah. a few years ago, yeah. Um, and the new one, yeah, I wanted it to be very similar to the Madrid sessions, and like what me and Tom do as a duo is different to me just making like a an album of traditional music okay. um, and i've been planning that for a long time to do like a, a proper wooden flute album of oh, really? materials okay. and uh with like guitar and power on and well, you, are and you going to play the guitar as well uh or would you i might do for some of it but i'll, I, I'll probably get someone else to do it just because it can sometimes sound weird when you do two of the things yourself oh, okay yeah okay you know um but I think that kind of the way we work, like a, we picked tunes that worked really well with the with the piano, and it's more of a duo collaboration than a flutes playing the tune and pianos playing the backing. You know, yeah, okay. Giving him space to change the harmony and move it around and take some little some piano solos and stuff. And, yeah so like if it's a cut yeah the madrid sessions obviously i'm trying to think of a way to describe what that album is obviously it's flute and piano you're playing on silver flute there's folk tunes and stuff like that in it but the harmonies and the flavor of the album it's quite hard to describe do you have a way of describing it um for both albums that style tom's playing is a kind of like gospely mccoy tyner uh herbie hancock kind of oh. uh jazz fusiony although you know people keep telling me not to use the word fusion so it'll put people off but 
I love the word fusion. I love it. I'm like, and I also know, love the way I asked you to describe that because that was much better than what I was yeah, going to say. You, the thing is, if you're not putting some people off, then it means it's too popular. It's too... Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, you know, too mainstream. You've got, a, you've got a niche down. You do. You've got it. Yeah. Can't be quality. Can't it. Well, there's not much more niche than that, to be fair. <laughs> That's a very niche album. So yeah, I just want to describe it because obviously the Clearwater Sessions is coming out. So comes out on the 17th of March. Is that on streaming services as well? Yeah, it'll be streaming, it's all uh, vinyl, vinyl party CD, all the stuff, yeah. And where can people pre-order it now? Is it ready for pre-order? Um, yes, by the time this is uploaded, there'll be a pre-order, pre-save thing on my website. Actually, yeah, by the time this stuff. comes out, it'll probably be 9th, 17th. It'd be near enough coming out. It'll probably be a week away from coming out by the time this Great. episode comes out. Oh, that'll be exciting. Ooh, okay, so... Yeah, can you describe like what what can we expect? What can someone like if somebody hasn't heard the Madrid Sessions album first? So tell me if they haven't heard that, what can they expect from this record? Um, this one is half silver flute and half mm-hmm. wooden flute. Okay, um, and it has one whistle track. Um, and I would like to think that without reading the liner notes, it would be difficult to tell which flute is which. Oh, that'd be a fun... Do you say in the in the inlay or anything? It does say, yeah. And okay. um, uh, one or two of the tracks I've used, the para Alcon head joint with the little wood lip. Um, okay. I don't have it here, but um, it's just the lip is wood. And there's no... Okay. Um, the blowing edge is also wood. So it's it's gives the flute a real... Um, it makes it a lot easier to make the silver flute sound like a wooden flute. So was it kind of um, like the the Manka head joints? Is it something like that, silver and then a wooden lip plate, or yeah? And it's okay. but it's seamed silver tube, and the lip is wood. Um, and I really love his head joint cuts. Like uh, I was at Just Flutes doing something else, and he'd just come in to show John some of his head joints a few years ago, mm-hmm. and I was and I was and John said, "Oh, Philippe will try them," and I tried to buy one off him. Then this was like maybe five, 10 years ago when he was first okay. making them. And then when he came back and, and uh, had some, I was like, yeah, I need, I need one of those. Like it gives you, like, I would like to say like most of the stuff, I'm just playing the silver flute, the Altus with its original head joint and yeah, absolutely love it. Like the, the kind of tonal control of, of that flute is, is spectacular. They but are good flutes in a loud session that wooden lip gives me a little bit extra volume for oh, okay. the silver flute. Um, and most of the time in a session, I will just play wooden flute because that's what I want to work on at the moment. Okay. Yeah. So it's a chance to practice. Um, and recently I've started taking my ill and pipes to sessions because wow. I really need okay. to get better at those as well. <laughs> uh, there, I love when you see ill and pipes rock up at a session, man. It makes my day yeah. when I see them. Well, agree. you know, you, you haven't heard me play them yet. So. <laughs> Okay, well, well. Um, so yeah, clear water sets and sense. So, what can we expect? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, flute, I Irish really flute, your question. Well, don't worry. No, we listen. This podcast always goes that way and this way. The, the listeners are well used to this. <laughs> We've stayed worryingly on track. I'm doing very yeah. well today. I'm very happy with that. So, okay, so um, one of the main things was I wanted uh, the mics really close to the flute because I hate it when I go and watch someone playing the flute and they're miles away from you and all you can hear, like the piano is overpowering the flute. Um, yeah. Flute players having to, you know, had to buy a flute that plays as loud as possible just to be heard. Yeah. And you don't hear any of the nuance because it's lost in the, you know, the harmonics of the piano is like just yeah. suffocating all of yeah. that. And like, I want to stand next to the flute player here. I want to be able to hear. Yeah. Like, yeah. What what they're hearing, you know? But, um, sorry, can I just ask then, does that mean it's going to pick up things like the keys clicking? Or can that be removed um, digitally? It's quite close to the. It's mainly close to the to the armature, so I don't okay. think you can really hear the keys on there. I actually like Plus, when you can. But, uh, it's you know, I mean, it's an Altus, so the keys don't make any noise. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> if Altus want to sponsor this episode, by the way, that was a great <laughs> plug. <laughs> Come on, guys. Anyway, yeah, um, one microphone or two for the flute. Um, two. And I've tried lots of different things over the years. Like if I'm recording at home, um, I use a AEA R84. It's like a big mm-hmm. ribbon yeah. thing. Um, and I find that just does the job um, 
on flute and whistle and it just calms down any of that harshness in the kind of high yeah high yeah. Um, there's a real art to it there's real yeah, art to I, good recording i this was the first time like occasionally i've had one like um like a u87 or something like a big old condenser and yeah. then um a mic over the body um yeah like a sennheiser m dm 441 or whatever it is yeah um and i quite like that sound but this is the first time we tried something different um the engineer um stephen clark not the flute player ah, um just about to say was <laughs> um absolutely brilliant and just super quick super professional and he put a it was what was the mic it was a u47 u67 the neumann mm -hmm. like a sort of yeah they're gorgeous. Five grand. Yeah. Big beastie. But and then he put a really cheap ribbon mic next to okay. it. And mixed the two together. And it's just sounds amazing. Like it's um and weirdly, like mm. either of them on their own, I was like, I don't like it. And then together I was like, yes. <laughs> that's ah, the sound. That's interesting. And so then do you think it's the kind of album you would recommend getting headphones on to listen to? A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was skeptical about vinyl sounding better or different, but oh, I love them. Like it, the, it's just the warmth of it. I love like, it with the flute and the way the flute's mic'd. It's like, yeah, it's lush. It's really, really nice. Um, oh, and vinyls are cool as well. They're so cool to have a vinyl. Yeah. Just I think feel... it's, it's just nice to have that ceremony of, of yeah. putting it on and you know having to turn it over as well and like it's um, an event yeah having the because even cds have started to lose a bit of the you know it's like i oh, just fling the thing in the yeah um, if i'm going to listen to a vinyl i will listen to the whole thing because if i'm on spotify i'll probably just flick through it at some point or i'll pick it up later but a vinyl's like a thing it'll be an evening for me i'll take the evening pour myself yeah. a glass of wine or a gin and tonic and away i go and you know just it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a ceremony, as you said. I love that. I'm going to yeah. pay more attention to it because of it. Well, I, I mean, I bought, um, maybe 10 or 15 vinyl records before I bought a record player just because it was like <laughs> music that I really liked or yeah. a friend was doing a, a Kickstarter and, um, I, I got like the Avishai Cohen albums, uh, on vinyl. I got Martin Bennett, a couple of things I played on the Emma film, the, um, Oh yeah, Theory of drama that they released that on vinyl, and I was like, "Oh, well, I, you know, you have to get a copy of that. that I'm playing on." But um, oh, I yeah, definitely, move, a, yeah, a record player just for the listen to the test pressings. I was like, "This is glorious." <laughs> that's great. Okay, oh um, man, that's like so. It's all ready then. The vinyls are pressed. The CDs are ready. It's all ready yeah, to go. It's all ready to go. Um, I've also sent you a, and I don't have a copy here to show you because I've sent them all now. But I did full transcriptions of the flute part for the whole album this time whoa um because it's something that people always ask for for the madrid sessions yeah and i released some of those pieces for flute yeah. and piano but this one it has piano backing tracks like the actual piano from the recording because it was whoa. enough separation that we could do that and then uh the sheet music has everything i played including as much ornamentation as i could get in Oh, and so it's a towards, transcription from the the album itself, yeah. then. Oh, and all the man. like, I've made Tom go in and put all the chords in for everything. So, um, I'm sure he was delighted to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's so. Is that going to be like? Obviously, I'm getting it because you know it's me. But um, for everyone else, does that come with the album? Do you buy that separately? Is that going to be released, or is that that will be separate? I, any people who supported the Kickstarter have, have already got. Um, ah, of okay. It. Um, but it will be a PDF and a real sheet music um just for yeah. will be distributing it nice um, that's such a cool so thing to do in america you better get it through fleet world and um hopefully sort of everywhere but oh yeah they'll um, find somewhere although the pdf thing to download is a really great idea as well yeah um, i think like people have resisted doing it because like the worry is that if you make it available as a pdf people would just like share it around without without buying it and i think like you know ian clark um saying that a lot of people 
like he'll go to a master class and people will have like photocopies of the piece and they won't have bought it or whatever but it's a difficult kind of balance and i think it's made it so much easier especially now people are using ipads exactly music collection and um i found like even some people have, have said to me oh look i want a copy and i want a copy for my um daughter i'm gonna buy two pdfs i'm like one yeah. is fine <laughs> Yeah, but like people are generally quite sound about it, I find. And yeah. like to be honest, I bought your Irish Music on the Silver Flute book during Corona. And I bought mm. it as a download just because I was like, great, this is a download. There's no post coming to this house. I'm locked in yeah. here for like a year. This is great. And yeah, I've told all my students to buy it as well. And it's always a little bit cheaper when you buy it like PDF as well. Like you don't pay for postage or anything. And I think most people are just like, yeah, I'll just go. Because it's always like a couple of quid. It's never like, you know, 50 quid or something. It's always a couple of quid. So you're like, yeah. Yeah, and the, the import tax on stuff and like yeah the, the posting has been a nightmare for like um especially since the you know brexit nonsense is yeah. like well, we're not a disaster that, trying to <laughs> trying to get anything anywhere um actually i saw brian finnegan as well he's released a tune book recently mm. as well of a lot of his tunes i don't know if it's available for pdf yet one of my students has it definitely yeah, a physical I copy it. i need to get it i have it around here somewhere <laughs> oh, have you ever met him have you ever met brian yeah, I had lessons with Brian. Um, no way. When I was eighteen, probably, um, I was having lessons with Sarah Allen, um, yeah, the other uh, flute player in from in Fluke, yeah. And whenever Brian was there, he'd um, give me a lesson instead. Oh man, and he's one of my yeah, favorite players of all time. Yeah, me too. Like him and um, Mike McGoldrick. Oh yeah, like, McGoldrick's obviously incredible. Massive yeah. uh, inspirations, you know. Have you ever got to play with either of them? Uh, yeah, I played with Fluke. Um, I got up and did a tune with them when I was kind of, I oh. guess I was 16 or 18 or something. That's class. Um, at the Comedia in Brighton. And um, my friend Tim Eady was playing guitar for McGoldrick. And we were at oh. somewhere in Maidstone and I played a tune with with them there. Like, it, Yeah, I just, they're both... So cool such like welcoming musicians and yeah like really love the music and you know we were just um this weekend in glasgow we checked into the hotel and, and mike was playing in the session in the bar because he loves playing you know and that's yeah. like so lovely He's... to see people who still yeah love just there it, you know? yeah like one of the best irishwood players in the world just in a bar playing yeah. in a session yeah they're not just I've... doing the gig and going to bed though honestly if i was as good as they were i would 100 percent just do the gig and go to bed i would never <laughs> play the flute once if someone wasn't paying me for it never never i admire them so much for that because man unless those dollars are coming my way i am not touching the thing <laughs> so fair play to them they're much better than i am oh man i'm a big fan of brian finnegan as well so anyway before we go on um so clear what assessment is like 17th of march st patrick's day um available everywhere anything else you want to say on that may as well plug it um, now I'd say there's a couple of uh, slow airs that just solo flute. Um, oh. One of them is January Snows, which is a uh, Kevin Crawford mm -hmm. um, composition. It's a He said it's an a, a amalgamation of a couple of other traditional ones. but um, And then the rest of it is, yeah, half wooden flute, half silver flute. Amazing. Uh, a lot of my own tunes, which are, you know, traditional style. Um yeah, I'm I'm really pleased with it. Yeah. I think especially like when I was uh studying, I and I'd get an album, I was like, Oh, I really wanna play it. I'd love to be able to have the music and like have the backing track and stuff. Like um I really loved having did that. a did a C D that had like um backing tracks and stuff. Oh it. really? I didn't know that. Um I can't remember what it was. It was like a flying high with Altus or something. Um, ah. And I just like, I'd love for people to be able to to do that, you know. Yeah, I think it's a great idea as well. Because I remember when I was younger, like when I was maybe like 13, 14, 15, I loved that kind of stuff. That was the kind of stuff that made me practice and play and do it as if I had back and tracks. And if I had had that when I was 15, I would have never stopped playing it. It's great. It's really, yeah. I think it's amazing that you're doing it. Fair pity for transcribing it all as well. That's that's a lot of dedication. I like it. Well, yeah. I mean, I regretted uh, 
doing it after I was about halfway through. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, because it is. Did you do all the like the notation yourself then to put it, or did you do it by hand? Yeah, and... yeah. Oh, I, I had a um, I had a few long train journeys. I was doing a tour with the wilderness yet, and they live uh -huh. in Sheffield, so I was quite often getting the train up to them to go to go on somewhere else. So those sort of three hours just sat there with the laptop and the headphones was good kind of that's man, that know, sounds fun tap, <laughs> tap away. Yeah, um, well there's a couple we are, of then. moments when when i realized that i'd uh when i got at home and i was like oh i was doing that by ear and that's not what the notes are <laughs> ah oh you see but i like the way you've really notated them because then people will know definitely that's what it is and they're not sort of going oh he didn't do that and he didn't do that. that's it's a nice yeah. touch i'm looking forward to it yeah well then i'm going to just say to everyone that I, i'm trying to work out can I get a calendar up here? Bear with me on the professionalism of this podcast. Um, 15th, 20th. So that's this episode, this episode. Okay, this is coming out. Would that be right? One, two, three. 29th of March? Is, or 29th of February, sorry. That would be three weeks from, no. 1st of March. This episode will come out on the 1st of March, hopefully. If anyone's listening to this and it's not the 1st of March, then I have done something wrong. But anyway, uh, it comes out on the 1st of March. So 16 days away, the album's out. Um, what a better way to celebrate St. Paddy's Day as well. I'm not going to lie, probably I won't be listening on St. Paddy's Day. I'm preoccupied with St. Paddy's Day. <laughs> or if I do listen to it, I won't remember listening to it. But everyone needs to get on it. Um, yeah, finally, 18 years later, the sequel to the Madrid Sessions comes out. I feel like, I genuinely feel like that album has a bit of a, I want to say cult following is maybe not the right word, but I do feel it's got that kind of, because it felt like a bit of, it's, it, it felt like a small album at the time and it just exploded. Um, so it's so nice that there's, yeah, a, creative successor to it eventually i'm very excited about it i really am um i'm dying to get it all right a uh, couple of other things i want to ask you and then i want to do some quick fire questions for a bit of fun but okay. the reason i want to ask this is because i do my research um and i was on your website and then i'm looking through the stuff you've done i'm like man i didn't really know you did all this stuff because you do everything really and so recently um i want to ask about amy dixon the saxophonist oh, yeah. you worked with her on her album one of her albums or two of her albums uh it was one it was the dusk till dawn yeah thing i did i played uh whistle and flute and piccolo on a couple of the uh the tracks and how did that come um, about that was the guy that was doing the arrangements um asked me to to do it so i did that remotely um ah okay in my dressing gown with a with a pot of tea <laughs> lovely um, here what better way to record and yeah i mean i do a lot of a lot of that kind of remote stuff. I just did the music for a new ride at the Asterix Park in uh, Paris. In France, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you, like whistle how stuff does that and, even come about? That they're looking for music for the ride at the Asterix Park and they're bringing it to That's amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, those things are always fun and random and, and you know, someone recommends something. And that just comes up like one day it's in your email, email inbox. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah. That's class. Are you going to go um, and listen to it? I I would like to. A friend of mine went to the. They did like a launch gig, and I was in America, so I couldn't I couldn't go and play. But he sent me some videos of the park with like the whistle, yeah. kind of. Is it you know? That's so like, cool, man. You know, his manual whistle is everywhere. <laughs> that's great, man. That's so interesting. So, I didn't see that lovely, one. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I love that kind of stuff. That must be so much fun. Yeah, because the the two I have to say. Amy Dixon stood out, obviously, and the other two I have to ask about because I saw them they're in your biography. Uh, the Philip Glass Bowie Symphony. Oh, yeah. What's that? Yeah, Tell us about that. That was um, very fun. It was very hard work as well because it was at the uh, Royal Festival Hall, I think, and we did three symphonies in one night with uh, London Whoa. Contemporary Orchestra. Um, and when uh, when I said yes to it, I didn't realize it was going to be quite so much playing. Okay. <laughs> and I, and um, I didn't realize it was going to be piccolo. <laughs> oh, okay. So I was doing, uh, uh, Pasha Mansurov was playing flute and I was doing yeah. piccolo for it. Um, and I've done quite a few things with, with, with Pasha. Like, uh, we did, the, um, the Prince symphonic tribute at the Albert Hall. That's the other one I wanted to ask you about. Um, and that was great. I was doing alto flute. So I'm like, Man. I'm like kind of the, uh, I get asked the as the extra appendage yeah. for the ones, you know. Um, Man, how was the, the piccolo Prince one was really one... fun, actually. Like, the, oh, sorry, there's a lot of big piccolo solos in that Philip Glass stuff, unexpectedly. So what is the Philip Glass Bowie Symphony thing? Tell, just tell me quickly what it is. 
so it's uh, a symphony inspired by the melodies from from some uh, David Bowie oh, yes. stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, I like that feels like a lifetime ago we we did that, but um, you know, because it was like got the music, did three days rehearsal, did the gig, and then it's done and it's gone. Well, that's it. Know. Okay. It's, uh, but you know, and it's then... nice to it's nice to get to do some of that orchestral stuff still, oh, even when I'm spending most of my time playing trad or playing guitar yeah. or you know. Oh, it must be fun. And the Prince Symphonic Tribute play because I'm a huge Prince fan. If I could do that one gig, I'd be happy. I could retire if I got yeah, to do a was, Prince Symphonic gig. That was pretty epic. We did them um, for the rehearsal of I think the Purple Rain version was like 12 minutes long or something. Oh. So for the rehearsal, they were just like, right, we're just going to do a few bars of this just to... No, no, do it all. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, so yeah, Symphonic Tribute, is it like a proper, like, is it just a songs, not just, but is it songs arranged for orchestra or is it structured like a symphony? It was um, songs arranged for orchestra, but it also had like a band. So it had like a drummer, guitar, uh, had a um, electric violinist, Ginny Luke and she was singing and playing electric violin um, and a bass player and stuff. So was, was there any highlights from that? Any particular songs cool. or any moments you um, enjoyed? I mean, I absolutely love Prince too. I mean, probably the Purple Rain was the... Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's just like, you know, the audience were loving it. And, um, oh, and yeah, we did the, the Amy Dixon one. We did uh, the Classical Brit Awards but I only got the call the night before oh, yeah. because they'd had the rehearsal with the orchestra and gone, oh, this, Amy had gone, oh, this doesn't sound like the, the album. So they called up <laughs> so get him. Um, the guitarist and the bass player from Strictly Come Dancing. Okay. Uh, came and did it and they're both amazing. Trevor Barry and, um, oh, what's the other guy's name? They'll come to me. But, um, and then, you know, just playing whistle. And that was, I'd say that was, probably the best paid gig i've ever done because it was only like two and a half minutes oh yeah nice yeah and then you're home well you don't get home i suppose you get like a free dinner and all you get to go to the party do you well you know you get like a whole not at my age <laughs> oh well nah, well yeah this is probably why i shouldn't be offered these gigs <laughs> um yeah lots of tv just quickly actually if a flutist came to you and said they want to get involved in tv film work what's the advice for getting into that industry um, I kind of, all of those things have come really by accident. Um, okay. I like, it was a friend of mine was playing with Bewitched and he, oh man, stop, <laughs> just pick that <laughs> name up there. Yeah. He was playing fiddle for Bewitched. And... Sorry, can I just say, I just have the interrupt here quickly because a lot of the listeners here are American. I don't know if they know who Bewitched are, but I want to really <laughs> make sure they do know. Bewitched were an Irish all-girl pop group in the 90s that wore double denim all the time and their big song was C'est La Vie and they were amazing. They fucking rocked, man. So sorry, continue. <laughs> um, and he'd been asked by the agent that got him that for a whistle player for something. So um, I did one thing for them. And then I just kept getting asked to do more stuff. Not for Bewitch, no, for the oh, no. agent, sorry. So, oh, okay. Um, I think the first one I did was Des and Mel, which was a sort of daytime TV program. Yeah, I remember um, that. But it was There's... Roger Whittaker, who was uh, a singer who was famous for, like, whistling. <laughs> I don't know that, no. I'm gonna, I was, might, uh, I'll put a clip in in this. <laughs> I think it was, like, I want to say it was Danny Boy. It was such a long time ago. Okay. But, um, you know, it was playing miming whistle along with, <laughs> with that. And then that led to um, some more miming stuff and then some actual playing stuff. And um, the miming stuff is weird because quite often you'll be like, this this thing on the track sounds terrible. I'm not really sure I want to mime to this. Yeah. So a miming gig is where, like, you're like the flute player on camera, but you don't actually play. Yeah. Essentially, okay, okay, that must be a bit weird as well. Although that'd be nice, you don't have to warm up or anything, you just rock up yeah, and away you go. It's kind of nice, it's um, you know, fills the fills the diary up. Um, yeah, I'm here, I take up. So, yeah, do you think it's just more like, yeah, just a bit of luck and then being I think a, a bit of luck? I mean, you, you can always keep an eye out for other people who are doing that kind of thing and say, yeah, hey, I'm interested in doing this if anything comes up, and so it's all um, connections, yeah. 
having some good photos and having some good videos is yeah. helpful. But um, especially now, like, I mean, and I'm terrible at um, doing any of that stuff and keeping it up to date. Like, uh, I, am, I do start to get like photos, but um, I've had so many photos done at this stage. I'm like, please don't take another photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I I know, man. Self self marketing is a bit of a pain as well. But at least you're well, coming we... on the biggest food podcast in the world. Yeah, <laughs> got that one. I don't know if we are the biggest food podcast in the world, but maybe by the time this comes out, we will be. Um, okay, I want to rifle through then some quick fire questions to finish up because we have talked for an hour there, which has flown by. Um, no, you don't have to stress; it doesn't have to be too quick. People get quite yeah. stressed at this, and I don't mean to put them under pressure. Uh, do you have a favorite flute concerto? Um, yeah, no, I was thinking about this. And I think my, I have two answers. Go. One is just the bog standard Mozart. Yeah. Either one. Love okay. Them. Yeah. And I never got sick of doing them because I don't really, you know, play them that often, but I just yeah. feel like they're, they're beautiful things. Um, but there's a yeah. concerto for Irish flute and orchestra um, written by Miholo Sullivan. Um, That's exactly who, what I was hoping for. <laughs> um was the head of the course in Limerick. He passed away recently. Ah, I think. okay. Um, I hope I've remembered that right, and I haven't. Um... But I can get it in post. <laughs> yeah, my editing yeah, so... will handle it. We can fix your voice with AI to get the property yeah, if you but, got it wrong. Um, <laughs> and he wrote some some beautiful music. Um, it was Matt Malloy and Irish Chamber Orchestra, I think. Oh. And it's called, um, you might have to help me with the pronunciation, it's called Oilane, O-I-S-L-E-A-N, which is... I think Irish for island. Yeah, that um, sounds right. Yeah. Uh, but it's beautiful. My Irish is awful. Um, man. Someone gave it to me in a cassette tape in like 1996. And oh, that sounds like a I proper jam. I to that over and over again. It's just I'm going to have to go find that. It must be recorded somewhere. That's and a it good really, answer. you know, captures <gasps> that Irish flute sound that's just so magical, you know. Oh, man. That's great. I'm going to have to check that out then. I'll try and look that up. Okay, do you remember the first flute CD or album that you bought? Um, Just as a feature of the flute. The first one I bought would probably be Mike McGoldrick. Oh, okay. Morning you know which one? Rory. Because oh, yeah. it had a picture of the flute on the front. <laughs> which is usually the reason, isn't it? Do you see it at the shop and just... Well, you know, like so many of those albums, like I didn't know Matt Malloy was a flute player for a long time because... The, all the, the album that was in the shop was like Stony Steps. It's just like yeah, big fella with a beard. I was like, oh, it's yeah, it's just some like a fella. Songs. Yeah, 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 just always some fella in a pub. Yeah, um, and I mean, I didn't personally buy, but like uh, Matt Malloy and the Chieftains um, okay. album, which is kind of my first hearing. That's of, a good one. Like wooden flute. Oh, it's a really good um, one. Yeah, and it's such a beautiful album. And there's a really great video Matt on YouTube incredible. of. Uh, Matt Malloy and James Galway kind of in the I've studio seen this, together. Yeah, because yeah, Galway did an album with the Chieftains like not that long ago, to be honest, but 10 years ago, I think. Oh, sorry, yeah. Years. The album's called James Galway and the Chieftains. That's, ah, yeah, it's that one. It's that's... that one, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, then that's, that, that's yeah, I've that's heard that one memory. many times. Yeah. Um, um, that's a good answer as well. But I just oh. love that, you know. Um, and, and early on, I would have bought a lot of jazz flute albums as well, like Ooh. Roland Kirk and... Um, was just obsessed with all that the Atlantic wow. jazz um, proper education album then. and like just yeah trying to I was always trying to get as many flute albums to listen to as I as I could so much to yeah. my wife's dismay when we moved house and every single box was like more CDs yeah yeah. More CDs. <laughs> yeah and they're coming <laughs> um, okay well that's a very good answer I'm hoping that the next answer isn't as cultured do you remember the first CD or album that you bought in general um okay please give me an I, embarrassing one give me a stinker uh well boys to men oh that's more like it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what i'm talking about man boys to men that was good and listen i stand by that that's a great album boys yeah because they were american they were like the start of the boy band thing before the irish boy bands took over boys to men but yeah. they, they were they were quite they were quite they were very romantic boys to men yeah they had a real i think i vibe also them. got um uh michael jackson leave me alone the, the little tiny record oh that's a good um, answer though i don't like the good answers i want no boys the is exactly what i was looking for <laughs> I, mean, that's what I was thinking we, for we were in uh vegas before the 
uh, Salt Lake City NFA and um, Boys and Men were playing across the street. And I was like, <gasps> I really want to go and see it. And my yeah. wife was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you're a fully grown man get back <laughs> yeah oh man i would have went that would be class i can't believe they're still gigging but there must be a fair yeah. reason now boys to men um okay a piece that you haven't performed yet that you would like to oh i mean there's a lot of the classical repertoire that i have never uh had the facility to investigate or the the time to look at so um and i was supposed to be doing the um bark b minor oh. um in 2020 in the summer with my old youth orchestra and i was really excited about that because oh. you know it's me cosplaying as a classical flute player that'd be great um, yeah uh, but then that never that never happened so that i would i'd uh. like to do i would love to do something with um an orchestra yeah um and i've been planning to to turn one of the pieces with tom into like a um sort of irish concerto kind of thing uh-huh but, there's a bit of exclusive for the podcast then you know it's like the time marches on it took me 20 years to to write that <laughs> irish music on the silver flute sure. book and, yeah and to do the madrid sessions pieces so who knows <laughs> Ah, well, I'll come back in 20 years and you can tell me how it went. Yeah. Um, next one. If you could do any job outside of music, what would you do? Oh, um, I'd probably like to run a bakery. Oh, yeah. And a little wow. cafe just to be just to be like around coffee all day and pastries. That's probably a, a pretty lame answer. I don't know. I can kind of see you doing that, to be fair. That, that suits you, yeah. I kind of like the trouble is i've been playing music so long i can't imagine even imagine doing something else yeah when everyone was saying oh no you've got to retrain you've got to retrain it's like oh. I'm, I'm at i'd be absolutely useless at anything like, yeah. i can barely do this yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah man the retrain thing oh good answer and, though okay you know, um but two more questions is 2024 and we're back we're we're you know back doing stuff yeah we are yeah and i'm not going to comment on the conservative government uh right two questions left uh if you could have a pint with any musician alive or dead who would it be this is the new question i've added into the questions i should have put this in for my other guests i've okay. just brought you're the first one to i answer would this. pick uh martin bennett who is or was a scottish fiddle player bagpiper um he made some incredible like um fusion like scottish music and hip-hop breakbeat trip-hop stuff um, wow okay and he died um at age 34 um, oh. but he was like a massive massive influence for me um okay that, I've like, never I, would, heard him. I would also say mcgoldrick but i had a pint with him um a couple of months ago so just drop that in yeah i've already done it yeah <laughs> Nice one. Okay, and the last question. Do you have a favorite drink, alcoholic or non-alcoholic? Um, well, I feel like I mean, you have to say something Irish now, don't you? You're Scottish. You can't, <laughs> you can't give me like a pint of Carling here. That's not going to... Okay, I'm not, uh, like, not going to say espresso because like, obviously espresso is my number one. But yeah, um, okay. we drank a lot of artisanal kombucha during the recording. Oh, and I'm a big yeah. kombucha fan. The most, it's the class. more challenging, the better. They do some great ones in America. They do like a green one that tastes like a sort of vinegary pond water, and that's yeah, oh, that's really. But man, it's not loaded with caffeine. Caffeine kombucha. I always get like wired off it. Is it? Oh, I think well, it is. Maybe I like it so much. I, I get wired off it, man. It's <laughs> it's wild for me. Yeah. Um, and then oh. if if you had to push me on a on a on a alcoholic drink, I obviously Guinness. Oh, but here, no, perfect answer. There you are. I did not say to say that. And if Guinness want to sponsor this podcast, <laughs> Guinness and Altus can join on board. Great. Well, that's it. Um, I'm just going to take a quick second to tell everybody. Oh no, you can tell them where can we find all your stuff. What should you? The floor is yours. You can plug whatever you um, like here. So philippebarnes.com, Instagrams, Philippe Barnes. I'm on Twitter, but I don't really use it. Don't okay, really... and to spell Philippe, just to make sure, I'll put it in. The... Oh yeah, oh, I'll be in the so description it's... anyway. One L, three P's. Three P? Oh, yeah, the P at the start and two other P. <laughs> oh, man, I've got that wrong. Um, yeah, it'll be in the description anyway. Actually, I just have to make sure I get it right. Okay, so go there, check it all out. And obviously, the Clearwater Sessions comes out on the 17th of March. Obviously, get a copy. 
please get a copy and then uh, come and tell us how it went and what you think of it great well then i'm gonna hit stop record and we'll have a little chat um thank you everyone for listening i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did and thank you philippe for coming on that was a real it was a real cool moment for me as well personally as a fan so thank you very <laughs> much for having me. Yeah.